going to cover a few topics. Um, we're going to try to pragmatically approach what it means to invest in the longevity space by talking about the past, where the industries come from, the present, what we're seeing today, and the future, things that we're excited to see going forward. There's a great book called Merchants of Immortality, if any of you would like to dig into kind of the history of longevity. But I'll summarize a few parts of it for you. Longevity investing has actually been going on for a while. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, three companies were started to kind of pioneer this field. Juron by Michael West, Elixir, and Certrus. And if you looked at the people who were really important in the field at that time, so Lenny Hayflick, who was the first discoverer of the immortal cell, uh, Cynthia Kenyon, who was my old mentor and uh, was the first one to discover that you could make worms live twice as long as normal when making single mutations. And Lenny Grente, who was uh, pioneering the field of sirtuin proteins longevity, they were the founders of these kind of groundbreaking companies in longevity in the early 2000s. Now, the results of this first bubble looked great on paper for at least one of the companies. In this example, Sirtuin Pharmaceuticals had a great trajectory for investors. However, unfortunately, that did not play out well for its ultimate acquirer. The company was bought five years after inception for about $720 million, all in cash up front, a great return in biotech, but the drug that it was developing failed to work. This put a damper on the field. Secondarily, Elixir Pharmaceuticals, also a great company started by incredibly um, well-known and successful venture capitalists, Arch Venture Partners, um, failed to commercialize on their technology. Um, Bob here, Bob Nelson, the uh, founder of Arch, describes the struggle to make the science work and to find a great CEO. And so of the companies that kind of started the first bubble, um, there was this kind of little whimper as the air deflated from the balloon, um, and we thought the industry was going to go under for kind of the next um, decade or so. However, I want to remind everyone of something. In biotech, success is a long game. I'll give you one example that I think is quite informative. In 1996, Arch, the same venture fund that started Elixir, this failed longevity company, started another company called Excite. Excite was working to make T cells engineered to fight cancer. Excite was founded in 1996. It shut down after failing to make the technology work in 2005. Nothing was wrong with the fundamental premise of this company. However, it's just very technically difficult to make a lot of these problems succeed. Financing can be an issue, and just technical progress like literally limits the rate at which you can make these discoveries work. In 2013, eight years later, the same venture capital fund, Arch, funded a company working on the same idea, Juno Therapeutics. And five years later, the company sold for $9 billion, one of the largest exits in all biotech history. I say that's not to claim that our companies will mirror the same trajectory, but rather just to point out that many times great ideas are still great ideas decades later, but kind of technical progress allows you to finally capitalize on them. Um, for example, Arch started a company around a different premise, also in the field of longevity, also in 2013, Unity Biotechnology, and managed to IPO that company within five years of inception as well. Um, I think Unity is doing a great job of bringing their first kind of drugs to clinic. And while, you know, who knows if their first drugs will be um, successful, it's exciting that this idea is finally showing fruit kind of in patients. Let me take you back to the first time I tried to raise money for longevity. Um, I had just left college. I had no financial degree. I had no money, actually. Also, I had 10K in my bank account. And I was so ignorant of finance that my first fly deck claimed that we'd get to, like, $10 billion in year five with nothing in the interim. I just knew that really big numbers were important and you had to have at least one on your slide. Um, so this was the first attempt that I had to raise money. As you can imagine, after two years of showing the slide, not a lot had happened for me. Um, and so I kind of felt like a washout failure after two years of trying to convince folks to invest in longevity. That's when I personally got my first lucky break. Um, I saw this article, uh, well, this is a New York Times picture, but this article was in Nature, um, describing it that if you took very old mice and eliminated a subset of their cells that were particularly old, you'd get an increase in kind of healthy lifespan in these pejeric mouse models. Not total lifespan in these models, but healthy, um, healthy lifespan. Um, and I met the founder of Unity at that time, and before he had closed his first round of investment, um, he allowed me to write a small check, and that was what got our fund off the ground. And this was in uh, 2013 kind of the first time that this resurgence of interest in the field, about a decade after the original companies were around, came back. 
Since then, our fund invested in five companies working in disparate areas of longevity. Um, those companies have an aggregate uh, since inception, which is about six years, or five years, and the slide was made, uh, raised about half a billion dollars. They've accumulated over a billion in aggregate market cap from kind of us being the first check-in. And all five of these, of our major fund one investments, have drugs in the clinic. Um, I think this is the most important and interesting part. Patients are now experiencing the benefit of longevity therapies today, en masse. Let me take you a bit to what's going on today, because it's really been a transformative time for the industry. In 2013, two very important things occurred, and I think it's important to differentiate these from the science, which we'll hear a bit about from near Barzilai later, and also from Aubrey this morning. Now, the science of longevity has been going on for a very long time. In fact, Cynthia's major discoveries occurred in the 1990s. However, what wasn't really occurring was acceptance by the mainstream pharmaceutical industry that aging was a disease or a mechanism worth studying and going after. So what happened in 2013 was not any shifts in kind of scientific strategy or the, the facts of nature. It was rather that two people who were very well known in the pharmaceutical industry decided to wholeheartedly kind of dive into this field, at least kind of in the press. One was Art Levinson, the former CEO of Genentech, the most successful biotech company of all time, leaving his posts to start an aging-focused longevity company with billions of dollars of backing from Google. The second was Craig Venter, the kind of well-known controversial person who helped sequence the human genome, um, diving wholeheartedly into the field of a company called Human Longevity, Inc. Um, all of size, I don't think that these events changed kind of the technical progress of the field, but I think that they were extraordinarily important to allow people to say, well, you know, if Art and Craig did it, then it's basically kosher for me to also um, kind of start companies in this field and view it as a, a normal area of investment and progress in pharmaceutical research. Six years after this kind of 2013 shift, um, I think there's been enormous change. So as Aubrey mentioned earlier, you'd struggle to find, you know, in my first year of the fund, 10 companies that were, you know, worthy longevity investments. Now we see, you know, 100 plus per year uh, longevity, and that's not even counting companies that I think, you know, uh, far exceed that number that are plausibly associated with longevity. These are kind of longevity focused companies per year. Additionally, you're seeing excellent new uh, advances, many new funds, and kind of mega companies such as Juvenescence, you know, and obviously Jim's an enormous amount to promote the field, um, and it's kind of similar uh, counterparty life biosciences. And I think more strikingly, if you add up the total amount of funding that's entered the space in the past six years, it exceeds $4 billion. This includes uh, funding for Calico and other entities, but about half of that is actually spread across many disparate small companies. This is an enormous amount of funding and a huge change from where we used to be, uh, an order of magnitude at least. Now, I want to add some pragmatism to kind of where we are today. I think that there are a few problems in the field to kind of counter this enormous positive statement. Um, and I'll just note these for you if you're interested in investing, um, you know, which uh, we're, we're kind of constantly thinking about. Number one, there's been an influx of capital from many people, many of whom are great investors, such as the, the folks in this room, and many also are just kind of motivated by mission. And I think this is enormously wonderful um, to increase the opportunity set for entrepreneurs, but also leads to a lot of lack of discipline when it comes to the structure and type of uh, kind of financings that are executed upon. Number two, many companies are drawn to the field by people who are passionate about longevity, but unfortunately, I think many of them focus on two obvious strategies. They pick the same five genetic pathways of aging, and kind of go after them with the same small molecule approach. I think things such as SENS and other ways to more um, entrepreneurially and uh, creatively expand the set of things that we're doing to target aging are really important to focus on and are very underfocused on in this current environment. Lastly, and this is the real pragmatic part, there's been a flush of seed stage investments, so investment in the very first stage, and all those companies are gonna to have to go raise their A at some point. So that's a great news for us A investors in terms of our optionality to invest, but I think many of those companies will struggle because there are just far too many, if there are 100 per year seeded, to all be able to raise an A successfully. So you'll see some weeding out of the best in the field in the next couple of years. Let me tell you a little about what I'm excited for with regards to the future of aging company formation. One graph that's always puzzled me is this one. And I apologize for its complexity, but I'll try to explain it to you. In blue is the amount of funding coming into biotech venture capital uh, here on a quarterly basis, but kind of projected out to show year over year. And what you'll see is that it's two to three X in the last couple of years. Quite literally, there is two to three X more money than there ever was before, and it was flat before, to invest in biotech companies. However, in yellow, you'll see the number of companies started per year. And that stayed approximately the same. 
this is a bit of a puzzle. Why can more money go into the industry but the number of companies stay the same? Here's part of the answer. While kind of the average financing or the median financing itself has not changed in size, venture investors are pouring far more dollars into a concentrated number of companies. This makes sense if you're a venture investor who starts a lot of your own companies, which is typical in the field. You have limited capacity, and so you have to put a lot of your money into just a few bets. And this is absolutely incredible for uh, those venture investors. I think many of those kind of mega funds, uh, Giovanni's and Flagship, said will go on to make incredible returns on the strategy. But you know, how on earth is this happening for all of those companies that should be being started but aren't? You know, why hasn't this influx of capital led to a competitive kind of corresponding increase in number of companies started in general across all biotech? Well, we went and asked a bunch of graduate students, you know, have you ever thought of starting a company? And almost all of them said no, 80%. Um, the ones that had, for the most part, were just afraid to. Um, many thought they'd risk their own reputation. In fact, many of them had never heard the concept of limited liability. They thought they'd actually literally go bankrupt if their company went bankrupt. And then 10% thought that they couldn't raise the capital. They literally couldn't imagine raising sums of money that were on the order of 10 to 30 million. I think it's very easy for us to forget, but a grad student has paid, in some cases, maybe 30K per year. Like, it's just hard to imagine sums of money this large and your capacity to access them if you're in academia. I know I've been there. It also looks very expensive to start a biotech. If you just read press releases, all the numbers are very large. However, what we know in the field is when you actually start a company, it's tranched. You spend a small amount of money in the first stage to de-risk an idea, a little bit in the next stage to build a team, and then you put most of the money in only after you spend a couple of years and a small amount of money to kind of prove out an idea. Therefore, one experiment that we tried last year to try to boost the number of new companies, I mean, 100 companies per year is great, but we'd love to get that to 1,000, um, was trying to reach out to graduate students and say, hey, you know, come to our office in San Francisco. We'll give you half a million dollars in lab space, um, mentorship by people who have built incredible drugs in the past, um, and we'll focus on helping people who haven't started companies before, for whom it's their first step into the industry. We accepted six companies into our first batch um, out of a large pool of applicants. And I'm super excited to report that of those companies, after they graduated, almost all that tried to raise the following round of financing. And in fact, over 30 million was raised within a couple months of graduating by a group of six companies. Um, one company went on to raise an $18 million Series A, and many others are also going down that track. This, I think, is the future of the industry. Um, and I'll fight for it quite hard. I think that you know, when you talk about the field of longevity, it's easy to get caught up in the science and the technology or the numbers of financing, but really the field is built by people. And we've never had fewer people able and trained to build biotech companies in the field than today. They're being snapped at, at incredible rates by existing companies. And so kind of the future that we're very excited about is A, this fact that the longevity industry has become one of the dominant industries, I think, in biotech and will continue to grow in the coming decades. But I think lastly that it's time to help new generations of biotech entrepreneurs get started, get financed, get funded, and get drugs to patients. Thank you.